Hello. In this video, we are going to cover graphical features of numerical distributions. When examining the graph of a, of a numerical distribution, there are three things that we look for. So those three things are going to be the shape of the distribution, the typical value or the center, and the var variability. Or the spread, how much the how, the how the data spreads out. We're going to go through those one at a time. This is a uh, graph heavy uh, in terms of visual image uh, lecture. And so hopefully we'll be able to I'll be able to keep track of all of the all of the windows I've got open with the different pictures to show you. All right, so let's start with shape. What do we mean by shape? Well, there are three characteristics. There are three things we look for for shape. Number one, we look, we, is, the, is the graph symmetric or skewed? We'll go through these one at a time. Let's just write them down first. How many mounds are there? And we'll go through that in a second. That might seem like a strange, um, strange, uh, strange way to think about it. But yes, that's we mean like bumps. They're like a hilltops, if you if you will. Uh, is there one or peaks? Peaks actually peaks is the best word. Uh, two, none, many. So we're going to go through and we'll take a look at those. And then three, uh, are there unusually large or small values? Okay, so those are the characteristics that we're going to look at for shape, which is the first of the three categories uh, in this in this video. Uh, so we want to look at each one of these. Let's let's start off with shape and let's jump to our first first graph. Okay, and so here we have two images. And so these are different. So, so if you, you've gone through, you've you've taken your data set, you've created a you know a histogram or a dot plot, and you're looking at your histogram slash dot plot, and the idea is that it could look like one of these two. Uh, so this one, this is this is uh, symmetric, and the idea is that if you put a line right down the middle, they're mirror images of each other. Okay, so this one is symmetric. All right, and then this one is skewed. And the idea is that, so we've got data, so the, the, it's not symmetric, first of all. Uh, and then the data kind of peters off and extends in one direction like this. This is called a right skewed in particular, right skewed. Why would it be right skewed? Because the data extends to the right. Okay, the, 
you've got uh um you know we'll get into we'll get into into tails uh, uh in a later video but uh that's what these these regions at the sides are called these are called the tails of the graph uh and then you, so you can see that this one has a big long tail that goes in one direction uh when that happens and it goes to the right it's right skewed uh, if it were the opposite and the tail extended to the left uh, then it would be left skewed. What are some examples? Well, can we look at some examples of data sets that produce these types of results? Ah, uh, yes, I do have some images for that. Here we go. If I can find them. Okay, so here are three data sets. Uh, and so you can kind of look at each one and, and judge uh, what the uh, what the proper term would be. So this one, if you look at it, this is uh, what is this? This is the heights of women. So if someone went through, they collected a bunch of data on heights of women, and uh, and then they went through and created a histogram. And so if you look at this, this is this is symmetric. Uh, so it's not perfect. But the data is not going to be perfect in the real world, but it's it's roughly symmetric. OK, um, and so what we can say from that is that the height of women uh, is symmetric. There are there are, you know, as you as women get shorter and shorter, you see roughly the same number or percentage of women as you as, as you go taller and taller away from the center. Uh, so that's what that means. Um, so if the average uh, you know, we'll get into averages um, that the mean in, in a later section too. But if the if the middle uh, woman is, uh, I'm not sure what it what it actually is, but if it's uh, five foot four or five foot six, I don't know, something like that. Uh, then if you go down six inches and you go down up eight up six inches, then you get roughly the same amounts of women as you go each direction, which is interesting. That's something that's kind of a, a cool feature. Okay, uh, let's look at let's look at our second guy here. So uh, this is the number of hours viewed per week, uh, and that is a skewed graph. It's not symmetric, and the skew goes to the right. So there are a few people, who, you know, so that a fair number of people watch a you know reasonable amount of TV per week, twelve hours, is good. and then as as you go to the right, as you go to the right, uh, you have. There are some people who watch a lot of TV. I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase this. Uh, there's some people who watch a lot of TV, whereas you kind of run out of out of space. There's no, you can't go negative. There's no negative hours of TV, and so the data kind of stops at zero. And so there's uh, a lot of people that watch a, kind of a minimal amount, and then it tails off as you as the amount of hours of TV goes higher and higher and higher. So uh, we've got symmetric, right skewed, and then here's an example of left skewed. So this is uh, test scores. All right, so here is an exam that's out of 32 that has a left skew. And uh, so, yeah, there's a fair number of students who performed well, and then you get less and less as you, uh, as you, as the scores get lower and lower. Okay, uh, so that covers sy symmetry. Uh, so let's move on to our next Next uh, characteristic of shape, how many mounds? All right, so one mound. And so one mound, if you had a data set uh, and it just you know went like this, that has a single mound, it has a single peak. So one mound is called a unimodal distribution. Two mounds. Maybe you can guess. Can you guess? It's called a bimodal distribution. So, like a bicycle. Uh, more than two mounds is called a multimodal.
Okay, and then there is a image for this. I can find it. Okay, uh, and so we can see examples. These are both bimodal. Uh, the one on the right is actually the more common where the mounds are not exactly kind of symmetric like this. They have in the same height. Uh, but uh, but yeah, these are still both bimodal. So examples of a bimodal or just a, a, a example of a bimodal distribution is if you go through and you do heights of men and women together uh, and you put them into one data set, you're going to get a bimodal uh, distribution. You're going to have a peak for where women, um, the heights of women um, peak, um, and then you're going to have a peak for where the heights of men peak. So you're going to get two separate peaks. And so that is a common feature when you go through and combine, um, you know, two combine groups that have different characteristics, uh, like men and women into the same uh, distribution. Okay, so we do have an example of that, not the height example, but So this, uh, although it's not labeled, what this is, is it represents uh, marathon times for a mix of amateurs and experts. space here. Okay, and so the idea is that this is the this is the frequency, the count of how many people um, had various times. And so you have your experts over here with a small amount of time uh, to go through and run the marathon and the expert group peaked at 150 minutes. So you kind of have a, a little peak there. And then our amateurs uh, were, you know, not that this is a, there's, so I don't, I don't want to give the wrong impression that there's a hard limit here. So some of the amateurs might be on the left side of this line, and some of the experts might be on the right side of this line. Uh, I don't know that line that's there. I don't know that that's a hard and fast line that's separating the two. It might just be there just, I don't know, for convenience. Um, you know, but uh, but anyway, the this this second peak is where the amateurs peaked. Okay, and so when you combine two different groups, you frequently end up with a bimodal shape uh, like this. Okay, let's jump back to our whiteboard. All right, uh, and then extreme values or unusual values. So one of the other things that you want to look for after you've looked at symmetry uh, versus skew, and then the number of mounds is, are there any extreme values? Are there any unusual values? So these are called outliers. And outliers can be a problem. So when we go through and do our and do our analysis of the data, some of the techniques that we use are some of the, some of the techniques that you involve adding values. Um, and if you're going through and you're adding a bunch of values, and one value is very different from the rest, it can suddenly uh, skew, or you know, maybe is a bad word to use because we have symmetry versus skew, but it can it can skew your results. Uh, it can mess up your results. Uh, and to illustrate that, we do have a picture. I can find it. Uh, 
uh, here we go. So uh, this data set, um, this is a, an, a teacher went through and collected weights of students um, for, you know, for going through and, and creating a histogram. And these were the weights that the students reported. Uh, they reported, and so you can see, if you looked at this data set, so you could see that uh, most of the students are, um, you know, within, you know, relatively close to, you know, 100 to 200 pounds. Um, and then we have a student who reported that they uh, weigh 1200 pounds. Uh, so I, you know, that, that's a, that was a, a typo. Um, and so in this particular case, if you went through and graphed the data set, you could identify things like typos. Uh, but my point earlier was that if you went through and took that 1200 and combined it with all of these as a, as a real result, um, and you went through and used a numerical, you used, went through and used a numerical technique to analyze the numerical distribution, um, like, uh, like adding up the data, uh, then that 1200 would, would end up messing up your results. Um, and so outliers are going to be a topic of conversation that comes up later in the course because we do need to pay attention to outliers uh, and deal with them when they come up. Okay, so that's, that's shape. Let's move on to our second category. And that is center. So when you're going through and you're studying data, uh, one of the things that the people are often interested in is what the typical value is. Okay, so a common desire when studying data is to find the typical value. Let's, let's think of some examples here just to kind of illustrate that. So one example is, what's the typical weight for an adult male? That might be something that you're interested in knowing. What, you know, why would you want to know that? Um, could, that could matter when it comes to designing an elevator and figuring out how many people could, you know, are supposed to be in an elevator um, or, you know, or, um, you know, something like that same thing goes with uh, with maybe with a plane capacity um, or something like that um, identifying what the typical value what the typical weight of the adult male is is just a, a something that uh, that you might want to know for a variety of different reasons even just curiosity how much does the typical male weigh um, another example could be you're studying marathons you're curious about marathons and you might ask yourself, what's the typical time that someone runs a marathon? And that is just interesting information to know. What's, what is the typical time that it takes for a marathon runner to complete the marathon? Often, finding the typical value is the goal of doing a statistical study. So you, you set out to study something, and the reason you're studying that thing is because you want to know what is typical. And so this notion of typical, typicalness is really at, at the core of going through and studying uh, data. It is one of, one, of, one of the main things that people are interested in doing. So how do we go through and figure out what the typical value is? Uh, well, it's often somewhere near the center of the data. Uh, let's take a look. And so you can see an example. Here's an example where it's really kind of obvious. So if you were given this data set, uh, the, gra well, the graph of this data set, and someone asked you, what's the typical value? You might go and look and say, okay, well, it's not perfectly symmetric, but it's kind of symmetric. There's a little bit of a tail on the, the left-hand side here. And so although the tallest bar is, is here between six and a half and seven and a half, uh, it looks like because of the tail extends over here to the left, that maybe that kind of offsets the the fact that the, the top top bar is is uh, you know is between six and a half and seven and a half. And so I 
I think the reason you can kind of see there's a darkened line right here. I think the idea is that the center, it looks like the center is right about six and a half. The idea is that if you took a look, looked at this closely, you might guess that the center was around six and a half. And so you'd say that the typical value is six and a half. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to uh, explain what the what this is. Uh, this is the distributions uh, of audience ratings for films in English. Uh, so this is what, how how audience members rated uh, movies. And so the typical rating that an audience member will give out of ten is six and a half, which is interesting. Uh, it's interesting to know how people rate how people rate films. Uh, so let's jump back again to the whiteboard. Um, and so one thing you can look at is you can look, you can visually examine the data and look for what appears to be center. One option uh, or idea that we're going to explore is what about using what's called the mode? So first of all, I got to explain what is the mode. Uh, so the mode is the most frequent value that is in the study. So there are issues with using the modes when studying numerical data. The mode is more for uh, cat uh, categorical data. Um, let's take a look at a couple of the issues with using the mode on numerical data. Let's see, wait to find, here we go. So many graphs that I have some, too many pictures. All right, so here's an example with a uh, histogram. So someone has gone through and took uh, the uh, ratings by critics. Um, this is a different data set than the previous one. That previous one was rating uh, was not by critics. Um, they, they went through and they took ratings and they uh, you know went through and graphed the data uh, using a histogram. All right, so this is a histogram. So the first thing to look into what, well what's what's wrong with using the mode at, for histogram? All right, so if you the issue with using the mode, so first of all, uh, the mode right now, um, so this is a measure of center. So if you went through and used this as the measure of center, if you use the most common, um, the most frequent uh, element, the most frequent is the tallest one. So does that rating right there, does that look like the measure of the center? Um, and no, it seems kind of absurd, uh, you know, but, uh, but anyway, so, Using the, the most frequent, the problem that you run into is that it can be nowhere near the center. But another issue, which is just uh, specific to histograms, is that the bin width makes a huge, uh, makes a difference when it comes to going through and calculating the mode. So right now, this tallest bar, it's a little bit difficult to see, uh, but that tallest bar is, goes from 92 to 94. A little difficult to see, but if you went through and checked this, this bar is 80 to 82, 82 to 84. If you just cut count all the way over, you should get that one's at 92 to 94. Now, check this out. If you go through and change the bin width from uh, right now, which is, is is two, if you change it to 10, 
okay? And so if you change it to 10, the bin width of 10, instead of having 80 to 82, 82 to 84, we would have 80 to 90, all right? And so 90 is right about, let's see, 80 to 82, 82 to 84, 84 to 86, 86 to 88. Yeah, I was right there. I was right. Uh, so that's going to be right here. So this would represent, that would be uh, our bar from 80 to 90. So if you go through and, 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 and do a histogram where you have a single bar here, that bar is going to have the most number of elements in it. Now, look at that bar. Think about that. So this bar would become the quote unquote typical value. That, this bar becomes the mode. All right, so the, the bar that we would get uh, in this interval. Now, but, but think about that. So the mode would be between 80 and 90 if we used a 10 size bin or between 92 and 94 if we use a two sized bin. Does that seem like a problem to you that if we you change the size of the bin, then it literally moves the mode uh, from one, you know, from one part of the curve to a, to a to a different one. Uh, so it's not, it's not, it's not even that they overlap. Uh, so 92 to 94 does not fall inside of 80 to 90. And so you could move the, 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 uh, the mode moves around. And so you could move your measure of center uh, would move around depending upon the size of the bins. Uh, so that's a, a bad feature um, to have that. Uh, and so histograms using the, using the mode of a histogram for your measure of what center is, uh, is not a good idea because of that. And, and just visually, it just looks ridiculous. Uh, there's, there's no way that's the center. OK, uh, now what about a dot plot? OK, so the issue with a dot plot when it comes to going through and, and doing a measure of center is that, um, so right now, it would say that this is the center. This, this is the mode. That guy right there, that's the tallest one. But the issue is if, if you went through and made a relatively minor modification to the data set, like if you went through and just added, you know, another, another couple ratings. So you added two more ratings or you subtracted two ratings, just a minor change, then this, then this would cease to be the, if those two ratings were right here, this would stop being the mode and this would become the mode. And the mode would, so the mode would jump by 10 points just by adding two more elements to the data set. Does that seem right to you? That if you went through and made a very minor change in the data set, then your measure of center would jump from one, from one point in the, in the, in the data set to another? Uh, I mean, if you added a handful over here, like you, uh, it wouldn't take a ton. If you added five ratings down here, then your, your measure of center would jump from here all the way to here, uh, you know, which is from one end, it looks like it's in the 90s, all the way down into the 30s. Uh, okay, so that's the problem with dot plots is if you go through and just, is, is that your measure of center is not very robust if you use uh, the mode. If you have a, a, a robust center, then if you go through and you collect a thousand pieces of data and you add two more, so you go from a thousand pieces of data to a thousand and two, your measure of center shouldn't shift very much if you just add two more elements to it. Uh, and so that's the problem with using the mode uh, with dot plots. So there's problems with histograms and there's problems with dot plots. Okay, so we're gonna move on now to the third, the third case, the third type of, uh, third feature that we're gonna look at. I can't remember what I called them. What did I call these? Uh, one, two, three, the third, the third thing, that's what I call it, a thing. Uh, so we're going to look at variability and spread. OK, uh, so if the data is very similar, then your graph should be thin and tall, whether it's a dot plot or a histogram.
tall and skinny. I used skinny instead of thin when I wrote my notes. Uh, if there's a lot of variety, then the graph will be wide and flat. Uh, let's take a look at an example uh, that will help illustrate that. All right, so here are a couple different, very small um, samples. We have a family of four that are all the, that are roughly the same height. And this picture is very, very similar heights. Uh, if you go through and you graph that the, the height of those of that family, then the same height, which is apparently 70 inches, uh, you're going to have just a single tall bar that goes up to the frequency, which is there's four people. Okay. Meanwhile, if you go through and have a family with very different heights, okay, uh, then here on the x-axis is where we've got the different heights appear, and then the frequency is each height that only occurs one time. So we have one time for the, the, this, uh, the short individual here on the right, uh, one time for uh, that girl, uh, and then one time for the mom and one time for the dad. And so the, if you have very different data, then that ends up turning into a very wide spread out graph uh, because there's, you know, there's not very many of each of them. And so it just kind of spreads it out. Uh, whereas if everybody's the same, then you when you, you end up, because again, the, the height in these cases is, uh, is the number of times an element occurs. So if the same thing occurs again and again and again, you're gonna, you're gonna have something tall. If everything, if lots of stuff happens, but nothing occurs multiple times, then it's gonna be very wide, okay? And so that's one aspect of going through and looking at graphs is to you know, look at how tall and thin they are versus how wide they are. Okay, so let's ask a question actually before I just show you the picture. How would you expect the distributions for public colleges versus private colleges to look? So think about that for a second. All right, so we're looking at the distribution, uh, and it's, this is the cost. Uh, the, what would you expect the distribution for the cost of a public college versus the cost of a private college to look like? Uh, is one of them going to be tall and thin? Is, is one of them going to be wide and um, short? Um, uh, anyway, you get the idea. Let's take a look. If I can find it. Too many graphs. Okay, uh, so here is the picture. And what do we think? So. Public colleges uh, is the top one, all right? Uh, and then private colleges is the bottom one. And so if you look at public colleges, what do we discover about public colleges? Public colleges tend to be inexpensive. And if all of the public colleges, are, if they're all inexpensive, then that causes them to clump up, not have very much variety. And then you end up getting a large number uh, of colleges you know, a, a, a large number, if the height is the number, the frequency, actually, this is a relative frequency, but uh, the same difference, then you're going to get a very tall graph because the, all those colleges are in a narrow range, you know, with roughly similar costs. Uh, by comparison, private colleges are very spread out. So there are some inexpensive private colleges, there are some expensive private colleges. And so because of that, they, they really spread out. Um, and you get much more variety. So tall and thin, there's not much variety. They're all very similar. Uh, wide and short, uh, there is a lot of variety. Okay, uh, so the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of try and sum up. Let's just go ahead and use another new page, why not? Uh, so 
describing distribution. So if you're asked to go through and describe a distribution, what should you do? Well, I think maybe it's kind of obvious, but you should go through and, and describe everything in this lecture. <laughs> uh, so you should give a, a description that includes the center, the spread, and the shape. Uh, so your the typical value slash center, the spread slash variability, tall and skinny. Oops. Variability and the shape. And we went through a couple different things for the shape. We talked about symmetry versus skew the number of mounds. So you wanna go through and give, uh, oh, and then if there are any outliers. Okay. Blank there for a second. Uh, so uh, if the shape is bimodal, so this is just a comment, and I didn't say this earlier, I did mention you know, the idea of bimodal, but if you do have a bimodal distribution, uh, it may be more appropriate to give two measures of center as opposed to one. Right, so if we kind of just jump back to our picture that we had for, for, for um, there we go. Uh, if someone asks you where the center is, it might make more sense to, to give two measures for center and say, you know, it's bimodal and we've got a center around here and a center around here, you know, or a center around here and a center around here, as opposed to going through and giving them something that's directly in the middle. Um, so that's just going, the, the, the issue is, is that when you have bimodal, bimodal distributions, the idea is that it likely means that there's two different groups, uh, as we kind of kind of discussed. And so going through and giving a measure of center for each group is going to be more meaningful than giving a measure of center that's, you know, right in the middle, you know, between the two groups. Okay, so that's what I was about to write down. Uh, if bimodal, it might be more appropriate to give two measures for center. And then finally, uh, if there are any unusual features such as outliers, it's good to make those explicit. Okay, and so there's our video on graphical features for numerical distributions. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.